On today's show, Kevin Porter Jr. with a monster game against the LA Lakers. Alperin Shingun makes his return to the Houston Rockets lineup. And hey, the Rockets actually looked good defensively with Alperin Shingun on the floor. How did they achieve that? Plus, Jalen Green struggling against the Lakers. Why was it that Kevin had such a good game, but Jalen really struggled from the floor in this game with no Anthony Davis, no rim protection for the Lakers? We're going to break down all of that and more coming right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green, Alperon Shingun, and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, if you and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube, where I want your thoughts on Kevin Border Jr.'s performance in this game against the LA Lakers. Let me know in the YouTube comments. As always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Basketball GM. If you have ever dreamed of becoming an NBA GM and managing your own basketball franchise, then this is the game for you. Download the game, just visit ultimatebasketballgm.com or look look it up in the App Store. Listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On. that's all caps, Locked On in the game. Joining us now to talk about the Houston Rockets 114-110 win at home against the LeBron and AD-less LA Lakers is none other than Madison Moore. You can follow on Twitter at Madman Leaks. And Madison, look, the Rockets have gone streaking now. They've won a couple games in a row. It's not often that we've been able to say that here at Locked on Rockets. This win against the LA Lakers, uh, quite you know, quite a bit less exciting than the win that they had recently against the Boston Celtics, but still maybe some good to be taken away from this game. And the player of the game, how, he, how could he not be the player of the game? Basically a one-man army out there for this Houston Rockets team. Kevin Porter Jr., who was phenomenal in this one. He had 27 points, 11 of 17 shooting, 2 of 5 from 3, 3 of 4 at the charity stripe. He had 9 rebounds, 6 assists, had a steal mixed in there, 3 turnovers. I, I mean, he had a really, really strong showing in this one. What were your thoughts on his performance? Uh, I mean, I thought he was spectacular tonight. I mean, uh, the thing about Kevin Porter Jr., the thing about the Rockets is the Rockets have been largely competitive. And one of the reasons has been Jabari Smith, but a big reason has been Kevin Porter Jr. and his consistent play. And that's what we want to see out of Kevin. We know Kevin has the talent. We know he has the ability. And tonight I feel like he really put it all together. Um, and he made a lot of quick decisions, whether that be shooting the ball or passing it, right? That's the biggest issue we have with Kevin is Kevin can sometimes get into these stretches where he lull and over dribbles, but that we didn't see any of that tonight. Tonight, he got in and out of his sets quick. He got off the ball quick when he needed to, and then he scored when we needed him to. So I was really, really, really um, happy with his performance tonight. I think he brought an edge to the team. I know him and Dennis Schroeder kind of probably have some uh, a little past back. I mean, you know, have some past, uh, you know, with when Schroeder came and and was with the Rockets. So I think he he got up to play against Schroeder when he when he got in. But he he played really well within himself within the floor of the game, and he moved the ball well. And I mean, that's all you can really ask for for Kevin. It looked like. Like they, you know, they they shared some words early in this game, and it looked like Kevin, yeah. you know, Kevin had scored on Schroeder, and then had some words for him as he was going back to play defense, and it looked like he looked at Schroeder and said, "You are trash." Like he, I mean, <laughs> he he had that moment, and then from there, like this is the thing with Kevin, right? Is he has these games where he gets when 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 guys are talking smack back and forth, and there are words flying, uh, you know, emotions, tempers flaring, whatever. It's like Kevin locks into a different version of himself where he's like, all right, no, you're going to talk to me like that? All right, cool. Let's like, he's like, bet, let's see what happens. And he was so locked in in that first half. He had a significantly worse second half, unfortunately, because I think he went into halftime and he was nine of 10 shooting from the floor, if I'm not mistaken. At halftime, he finished the game 11 of 17. So that means he went two for what, eight in the second. Sorry, two for, I can't do math. 
two for nine <laughs> in the second half, two for two for eight, two for eight. I can't do math. Um, so, uh, you know, sp- slightly, you know, less efficient second half than you would like to see out of him. But he was still really locked in and engaged, right? And he had that mm-hmm. moment with D'Lo where he was, you know, closing out hard to D'Lo at the three-point line. And D'Lo came down and, like, swiped his, like, finger across Kevin's, like, so eye weird. or whatever. It looked so bad when he was walking mm-hmm. off the court. He had, like, blood gushing mm-hmm. down his face. He looked Shane Battier-esque in, like, how bloodied mm-hmm. up his face was. And then he comes back out at halftime, and you see, like, he's got the stitches over his eyebrow. It's, like, this tiny little, like, he looks fine, right? And then he plays the rest of the game with the Band-Aid over his eye. But I think your your point about his decision-making, right, is what really stood out to me is he has this tendency, when he's playing well, when Kevin has his, quote-unquote, good games, it's because he's making quick Con, you know, concise decisions, right? He's not doing too much with the basketball. It's not too much of the hezzy, hezzy tween action. It's just, okay, mm-hmm. I'm going to bring the ball up. I'm doing this. Either I'm going to attack or I'm going to get the ball to somebody else and we're going to get going and we're going to, he's been pushing in transition, all of that. And then mm-hmm. in this game specifically, the Lakers without Anthony Davis have absolutely zero interior defense. I don't know if you could have negative interior defense as an NBA team, but they do. Like this Lakers team has negative interior defense. Uh, Kevin feasted on the interior, right? Kevin had it was two of five from beyond the arc. He got whatever he wanted at the basket. Um, a lot of the Rockets got whatever they wanted at the basket mm-hmm. in this game. Kevin even had a couple offensive rebounds in this right. one that he was able to just put back up for two because the Lakers mm-hmm. had zero interior presence. And to that point, there's a reason why Jay Sean Tate off the Rockets bench was six of seven for 12, sorry, 13 points off the Rockets bench because Tate was able to get down into the land of the trees and it was like somebody came in and chopped down the entire forest. There was nobody down there to contest shots at the rim. So they were able to get anything that they wanted going downhill. Yeah, no, I, I mean... I think the offensive of rebounding and really two man game between Shingun and uh, KJ Martin really held us together uh, when the Lakers made that run in the second half. I mean, the Rockets really lean. We were making shots in the first half, but the shots just were not falling at the same rate, um, especially from the three point line. So the Rockets needed to find a way to generate some points and KPJ, um, Jay Sean Tate, uh, they they crashed the offensive boards. We got some easy easy looks that way, along with the with the uh, pick and roll game between KJ and uh, Shingun and the inverted pick and rolls. And I I really thought it was in, it, that was very important because the Rockets had played such good defense all game, but it was important that they figured out a way to score when the shots wasn't weren't, weren't dropping. And I think they did a good job of that. And it's kind of the way they've been scoring all season you know what i mean so it was good for them to be able to tap into that and say hey when shots are not falling there are other ways we can go out and hustle and get points and with the the lakers lack of size tonight you know they, they really punished them in that area we're going to talk about the houston rockets defense and what stood out mm-hmm. in this game as well as jalen green and his struggles in this one just four of 13 shooting for 11 points feels like the first really rough game that we've seen from jalen green in a long time we're going to get there mm-hmm. in just one moment but first today's episode is brought to you by ultimate basketball gm I'm really excited by our new partner and sponsor of today's episode, the mobile game Ultimate Pro Basketball GM. Because look, if you've ever dreamed of becoming an NBA GM and managing your own basketball franchise, well, your dream can come true. And this game is absolutely for you. Manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the season, and lead your team to glory. You'll be responsible for hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and training players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft, and all the ups and downs of an NBA season. This is a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want and when you want to. We already made a locked on league with all the locked on hosts. So we're already talking smack and we're going back and forth and talking about who's going to win titles and who's trading for players. It is a ton of fun. I'm actually so addicted to it. I'm not usually a mobile game guy. This one is so much fun, though. Locked On Rockets listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game store, so make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app store. That's probasketballgm.com. Ultimate Basketball GM, start your dynasty today. And continuing on here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Madison, they, you know, it's so funny because you 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 pointed out on Twitter early in this game, you said that the Rockets are playing so good defensively. And I, I couldn't skip out on the opportunity to quote tweet you and say, that's a damn lie because Alper and Shingun is playing. And I was told that <laughs> the Rockets can't play defense when Alp is on the court. And yet 
they did, they look good. Like they were actually, and here's one thing that I wanted to highlight specifically about them defensively. And I want your thoughts on this as well. I really like that, right. They, they, they have this drop coverage scheme with LP, but they have kind of like a mix. It's like a very defense where the, they run drop when LP is on the floor and when he's involved in the action, but then they also switch any of the actions mm -hmm. that don't involve Shingun. And mm -hmm. that really helps. I, I feel like the Rockets defense overall, because it kind of simplifies some of the stuff. So when, you have a team like the Lakers that wasn't just like, you know, with Dame or with Clay the other game against the Warriors where they're just putting Al P in the blender over and over and over in the pick and roll. Having the other four guys on the court actually switch all those actions really does flatten out the offense. And so that's what happened to the Lakers is they weren't just spamming the pick and roll with Alper and Shingun every play down. They were trying to do some other stuff not involving Al P's man, which was Vanderbilt in this game. And it actually didn't really work out for them offensively because the Rockets were able to switch. And so you got kind of a, a glimpse of some of that defense that worked so well in the Celtics game. So I was actually really encouraged and, and kind of pleased by that. But that, that maybe has a bit more to do with the Lakers not identifying the Rockets' defensive weaknesses than it does about the Rockets doing anything spectacular on defense, I guess. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I really thought... So for me, what you said is correct. Them switching everything that Shingun was not involved with, I thought that was a good development. And I don't think we've seen that that often this season, right? And, and one of the big things that I... Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I think we've seen it like before, like in spurts, but like it feels right, like they've, right. they've almost, it feels like they've almost added it as like a base level of their defense. We're like, okay, Shingun's on the floor, drop coverage when he's involved, but if it's anybody else, switch. And like, it's almost like they're trying to make it just as simple as possible by adding that instead of saying, okay, only do it when X, Y, Z, or only do it when like I call for it. It's, it's almost like they're rolling it as their, their base level defense. Right. And, and, and I'd add to that. I also liked that Shingun wasn't in a very deep drop. He still was uh, playing contained principles, uh, which allowed his man to, to catch up and he contained his man at the same time, keeping both of them in front of him. I thought Shingun did a really good job all night uh, uh, in that contained principle, but what made this defense, I think really click tonight is our our low men, our the the uh the rotations on those guys were so much better. They knew where they needed to be to to give guys the split seconds to rotate back to their man men on um on, on those pick and roll. And when Shingun is being low, Jalen and uh uh KJ did a very good job of helping in those situations. And I think that has been the missing link is that our help men are always late. They're just a second too late. And tonight, a lot of times they were on, they were on time. Now it helps that there's no superstar on the, there's no LeBron James. Make, on the makes floor. it just a little bit easier. <laughs> just makes it a little easier. No, no uh, Anthony Davis as the, you know, the man, the man that's receiving the ball, you know, that really helps, but it's really encouraging to see because this is the second game in the row where the help has been really, really solid. It seems like the guys are starting to understand, Hey, this is the read. This is where I need to be. I need to be there on time show. And then, in, the closeouts were amazing. Like I, I'm, I was really impressed by the way the Rockets got back and closed out, uh, especially Jalen Green, because uh, he had the, the the two guard he guarded. I cannot Beasley. Beasley has been a sniper this season. One of the best shooters in the NBA this season. That's the reason the Lakers traded for him. And he did hit a couple threes. But I liked that. There was a lot of good defensive sequences where everybody were constantly rotating multiple efforts and then a strong closeout, strong closeouts in the end. And the Jalen Green looked really good with those closeouts on Beasley because that's the guy I was most worried about because he can really light you up. And he's lit us up already this year um, at, in Utah. So um, I, very encouraging things to see. It seems like certain some of this stuff is starting to finally click for the young Rockets, and they're and they're giving their effort. A very a very motivated defensive performance. Again, it is a little bit easier when you're not tasked with right. chasing around a superstar all night. But baby steps, right? Like like you mm -hmm. know the other night, right? They Jalen Brown got whatever he wanted against the Rockets, but they did a decent job of slowing down Jason Tatum. And some of that was Tatum missing shots, but some of it was they were throwing their best defenders at Tatum, right? They were they were geared to slow him down, and so Jalen Brown got his forty plus, but Tatum struggled. And so you got to you know pick and choose, pick your poison, I guess, with certain teams. And in this game, the Rockets did a good job of you know having those coverages where they needed to be. They also had one moment where uh, Shingun actually, they trapped the ball, right? They sent a blitz. They sent a quick double mm -hmm. at, at two at the ball with D'Lo, and they forced the ball out of his hands, and the Rockets actually recovered for a split second, and then the ball got swung back out to the perimeter 
And then whoever whoever the ball got swung to drove it in and finished for two at the rim, or I or maybe got fouled or something. It, it ended in a, it ended in points for the Lakers, but like. 80% of that defensive sequence looked really good. And it was just, I was like pointing at the screen, like, see, you can blitz with LP. He's fast enough to do it. Like you can do this. And then you can like have Jabari or KJ or like Jalen, like on the weak side, like kind of covering two guys. Cause they've got the quickness to make that decision and figure out where they need to be and who they need to close out to. So every time I see one of those moments, I'm like, ah, it's there. They can do it. <laughs> like, see, I was told they can't, but they're doing it. So I just, I always freak out when I see those, but as, as encouraging as some of the signs were from this game, um, Jalen Green's performance was not super encouraging, unfortunately. Uh, he did hit a very, very big three-pointer late in this game that, that gave the Rockets a little bit more cushion. Uh, but 11 points, 4 of 13 shooting, 5 boards, 1 assist, 1 steal. He had 3 turnovers. This was probably the first really rough all-around game for Jalen in a long time. And maybe there was a sense from him that he didn't need to, like, he didn't. step up because... Mm-hmm. KPJ had it going and and KPJ was clearly cooking. But I will say a point of concern for me is Kevin clearly had it going and was able to get whatever he wanted on the interior because there was no Anthony Davis. Like I needed to see Jalen try to put it in overdrive and make that happen, right? Like if you're seeing your backcourt buddy get whatever he wants at the cup because there is no interior shot blocker, rim presence, whatever, Jalen should have been able to carve up this Lakers team just like Kevin did. And it, again, maybe it's a little bit of like, okay, like Kevin's got it tonight. Like I can take my foot off the gas pedal a little bit. I'll shoot the open shot. So maybe there is something to be said for Jalen not trying to force the issue or trying to take mm-hmm. over when he was clearly having a rough game and kind of just trying to let the offense come to him. But I would have liked to see him be a little bit more aggressive to try and get himself going, if that makes sense. Yeah, so so for me, because KPJ was doing so well with the ball in his hands, Jalen kind of played an off-ball role tonight. And because he played an off-ball role, we didn't get to see him in the pick and roll with Shingun as much as we would like. We didn't get to see him in the pick and roll with KJ as much as we like. And, and we didn't need it, right? And so he was kind of serving as a lot of his attempts were catch and shoot attempts, you know, within the flow of the offense. And his jump shot wasn't, wasn't falling tonight, right? And so with that, end up doing was it was like okay well I don't have to have the ball in my hands but I still need to be effective and try and score because that's what I do for my team and a lot of that manifested in okay that my jump shot isn't falling tonight so off the catch let me get downhill some and when he tried to get downhill it was off the bounce and the Lakers were overloading in the paint a lot they they overhelped in the paint and he did not have the benefit of a role man like to to bounce off of and kind of create the angles like that he normally gets so when he's driving into those and they're packing the paint like they did that's why the three-point line was open all night for us right Jalen tried to finish through contact through a lot three four guys and he's just not strong enough to do that type of stuff yet and it manifested itself in a in a bad game from not only outside the arc, but inside the arc as well. Well, Right. And, and Jay, I mean, Jalen was really getting defended like seven on one because not only was he trying to finish through contact at three or four Lakers in the paint, the refs weren't calling a damn thing for the Rockets. I hate, look, look, I don't know how many (laughs) times I've talked about it on this podcast. I hate complaining about referees. I really do. I, I, I try not to do it. The refs were on some BS in this game. Bro, Austin Reeves must be a superstar. I, Austin Reeves has to be a superstar because the way this man racked up, one time he just yelled at the ref and the ref said, oh, yeah, okay, foul. You yelled at me. You're right. I I couldn't believe it. That was when Jabari Smith, I think, got the tech. (laughs) <laughs> and then not, awesome. and, and then not to mention KJ's tech right for he he was under the basket finished oh the layup and he clapped KJ clapped and the referee was like no technical and then KJ was beside himself had to run to the other side of the court and put his head in his hands like I cannot believe that just happened thank goodness for KJ because he came back down on the very next possession caught a beautiful lob from Kevin one nice. hand he yammed it over the top turned around and then yelled at the official <laughs> it was like it was one of those where like the official kind of had to like I, I bet the official really wanted to team up and throw him out but honestly in that yeah. moment he was like you know what respect all right my bad like I that's on me I shouldn't have done that it was it was a fantastic sequence from KJ Martin but yeah the refs were were absolutely on one in this game um 
Coming up, I want to get to final thoughts from this one. Uh, a little bit more on the the Jalen Green struggles from this game. Uh, you know, one more point that I wanted to make on that, as well as the impact off the bench for these Houston Rockets guys, Jay Sean Tate, Josh Christopher, their impact off the bench, and then Jabari Smith Jr., who was trending upward, still had a, a you know an all right game. But game. we'll talk we'll talk a little bit about Jabari as well. We're gonna get there in just one moment after today's message from our friends over at Built Bar. The Built Bar March Madness Bracket is here. We know you have a favorite Built Bar or Puff flavor, and now is your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know that I'm going to be voting for Coconut Brownie Chunk. That is my number one favorite Built Bar. You can go vote for your favorite. Again, go visit BuiltMarchMadness.com, and when you vote, for your favorite bar or puff flavor, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built Bars. Not only that, but one Locked On fan will win a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built Bars' best bars and puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. You've got to try Built Bar. They are the best protein bars on the market. They're basically candy bars that are jam-packed with protein. High in protein, low in sugar, covered in 100% real chocolate. I don't know how they do it, but they are incredible. Run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there you can vote every day in march so hop in and support your pick and final segment here at locked on rockets your daily podcast home for everything houston rockets basketball one more point about the jalen green struggles i guess from this game and you know, Madison, we're talking about kind of the the role that Jalen played in this game with Kevin being so ball dominant in this one because he clearly had it going. Jalen was playing a bit more of that off-ball role. This is why it, it kind of still bothers me a little bit when we see Steven Silas elect to go away from the stagger because I feel like when you have two guys who are essentially, for all intents and purposes, the same player in Kevin and Jalen, the same archetype, whatever, I feel like if one guy has it going, then you can very easily just mold your rotations for the night and be like, okay, Kevin has it going. Cool. I'll sub Jalen out early and then I'll bring him back with like a minute or two in the first quarter so that he can run the second unit. And maybe he gets his chances to get his on ball reps when Kevin is on the bench. And then when Kevin comes back in, like, cool, Kevin can go back to cooking. So, but we had a, we had lineups in this game at one point that featured Tate, Christopher, Tari, Garuba, and KJ. Like it was like the old, it was like the old school goon squad with Jay Sean Tate as the point guard. And I actually called it. We were in Rockets Watch watching the game, and I go, okay, guys, the Rockets half court offense now boils down to Josh Christopher making shots or them getting defensive stops and getting out and causing chaos in transition. And right when I said that, Josh Christopher started hitting shots. He had seven points in like two minutes flat. And I was like, hey, it worked. Like credit to Steven Silas. But if Josh Christopher came in and started bricking those shots instead of making them at, at, at an elite level, which a couple of them were kind of bailout shots within the flow of the offense, things would have looked really bad from that second unit. So the lack of staggering or the fact that you have three guys in Kevin, Jalen, and Shingun who are your like offensive generators, your offensive hubs, the fact that there are points in this game that none of those three guys were on the floor was a bit concerning and continues to be a little bit of a weird trend from Steven Silas. It worked in this game, and Shingun was in foul trouble, so that's probably why he didn't come back in immediately at the top of the second quarter anyways. But on that point, let's get to Jabari Smith Jr., who, despite the you know the shooting uh, from this game, 6 of 17 overall, I mean, you'd maybe like to see that be a little bit better, but overall, I thought Jabari had a, a decent mm-hmm. game, all things considered. He was 6 of 17 from the floor. He had 18 points was four of six at the four of six or four of eight, four of eight at the charity stripe. Jabari even tweeted a gif after the game of like a Pistons player. I don't know who it was. It's probably somebody important in the Pistons gif, but like of a guy airballing free throw because he was clearly upset with himself about the free throws that he missed in this game. Uh, but he had six rebounds. He had an assist. He had a block, only a couple turnovers tied the Rockets in field goal attempts. He and KPJ led the team with 17 field goal attempts in this game, and he had the two back-to-back threes Mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter that extended that lead, gave the Rockets that cushion that they needed, made it 93-83, a 10-point lead. Lakers had cut it down to a four-point game, and Jabari had those huge back-to-back threes. So it was, overall, I think another encouraging game for him, even though he kind of came back down to earth a little bit. Yeah, and I thought he was really effective on defense. Like, I, I I felt his impact on the defensive end. And even though uh, Jabari's shot wasn't as, as good as it has been recently, um, I like the shots that he got within the offense. I like that we had 
clearly decided that we were going to make him more of a focal point. We were going to get him more shots. And I think he took a lot of makeable shots for himself. A couple of the threes were rushed early. I thought he kind of rushed them a little bit. But it was so good to see him get that open three when we needed a crucial point in, in the fourth quarter. And then for us to get a steal and him get his patent hit, walk into three, you could just – feel the impact of Jabari right you and and after that sequence happened it was like yeah we're, we're probably gonna win this game you know what I mean and that's the type of feeling and and that's why I say numbers aren't everything because I felt the impact of Jabari tonight you know what I mean I felt that he he was impactful on the court he was making winning plays he was making winning moves and he contributed to winning in a significant way so that's I, I, so I'm really happy. I mean, shots they fall, they don't. You know what I mean. But are you continuing to fight through adversity? Are you continuing to? Do I feel your impact on the court? And I and I can say that I did for Jabari. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. And and that's the thing is in this game, it felt like. It honestly felt like everybody across the Rockets roster had some level of impact, even you yeah. know, despite some of the box. Like you can you can point to Tari's hustle and energy on defense. Mm-hmm. He had the one, he had the one crazy yeah. play where he bricked the three in the corner, but went in and got his own offensive board. And then it looked like he was dunking. Hollins talked about it, it looked like he was dunking <laughs> on a nerf hoop. Right, he went up and just. Crazy put back Jabari elsewhere in this game, right? He had that offensive rebound and then put back where he went back up and like put it down really hard with the one handed jam. Like we yeah, haven't that was good. like Jabari's playing like a man down low, right? Like earlier yeah, this season, he is. was like a boy and he was like, okay, NBA, these guys are grown men. Like I gotta, I gotta up my game a little bit down here. And he is starting to play, like, really kind of grow into his body, understand how to use his size, his length down low. Even though he's not the biggest and strongest guy down there in the land of the trees yet, he can still get the ball and hold it over the top. There was the the point where... Uh, I think I forget if this was right after Jabari's technical. I think it might have been where he was walking away from a play... And I, I don't know who it was on the Lakers. Somebody was trying to snatch the ball from him as the as like to get yeah. the inbounds. And Jabari was just he held the ball out and then he held the ball up. Like he was just it was like a little kid was trying to reach for the ball and I was losing it. I thought it was the funniest little sequence ever. Because like imagine being a six foot eleven, nineteen year old, and you got like a veteran coming at you, you know, another a 25, 26 year old, whatever, and you're just holding the ball above your head, like, nah, you're not getting this. And Jabari didn't bring once Jabari brought the ball back down, he flipped it back to the referee, like, all right, here, you can have it. But it was just it was a funny little sequence sequence from him uh one guy too we talked about him earlier as as to how it does with the defense but I really do like that it, it felt like the Rockets came out with a very intentional game plan to get mm-hmm. Alper and Jingun involved early right like it's like okay you missed a game it's your first game back we're gonna get it was like three or four or five possessions in a row to start the game we're straight up like mm-hmm. LP post-ups right they were like we're gonna feed you early and we're going to see how the Lakers react to what you do with the ball, and you kind of dictate what we're going to do. And, and there were a couple of possessions where he got himself some shots. He had the one nice dish. I think it was to K.J. Martin early in the game uh, mm-hmm. off a cut. So I like that idea of, okay, let's get the, let's see if we can get Al P. involved early because if he can get his – if he can get flowing early, then he can get into a rhythm and kind of be that effective, like, okay, we're going to go back to you occasionally, let you get some post subs. They didn't really have to lean on Al P. in this game because Kevin was so effective, but he still walked away with 13 points, nine boards, six assists, a steal, two blocks in 31 minutes played. Like, that's a good way to get Al P engaged and feeling like he's part of what's going on early on. And then even if you go away from him offensively later in the game, he still feels like he got his shot. Like I think early to make, you know, to make an impact. Yeah. I mean, I think that was an excellent coaching decision decision by Silas. I mean, there was with the personnel on the floor, there was a clear advantage for Shingun and we attacked that immediately. We attacked that immediately and it, it made Darvin Ham change his game plan by the, by the middle of the first half, they were in zone, you know what I mean? And then we put Shingun in the middle of that zone. He began to carve it up with his passing in that way. And, and that's what guys hit their first couple threes, including Jalen. And it, it, it got us off to such a strong start. And that's really important for the young Rockets in their in their confidence and their belief in themselves and how they feel about themselves. And so I think that was a really good game plan for uh, Coach Silas, and I want to tip my hat to him. And Shingun really had a great game, an all-around game. He was pretty good on defense. He had a couple blunders by just, you know, size. But all in all, pretty good. I like, I like how he contained and dropped. Um, I do have one gripe with Shingun. The only gripe I have with him is he has to pick his head up on those fast breaks. Yeah, you are gonna are you gonna <laughs> if you're gonna run these fast breaks. Number one, 
you can't be looking down at the ground hoping somebody doesn't rip the ball from you because because we're out and running. And, and you have to understand, yes, you're an excellent decision maker, but you can't make decisions if you are if you have your head down looking at the ball. Your handles, if your handle's not good enough for you to run a million miles per hour on the break, then you got to push it. You know what I mean? It was a lot of easy layups that we kind of missed out. And then he kind of goes to the rim sometimes and picks his dribble up and gets in no man's land. And he has to hope somebody makes the correct cut. And so, I mean, I just hope we get him on, uh, on some film and just say, Hey, look, we, we like for you to push the, push the pace, but you can't push the pace if your head isn't up. Cause sometimes you just gotta, you gotta just, sometimes you gotta just push it ahead. And that's one of the things I really like that I saw from KPJ today. KPJ had, uh, uh, got a steal or a rebound, and he just pushed it up early to Jalen. It, like, sometimes you don't have to dribble the ball uh, to the middle of the court and be the guy that that makes the alley oop pass. Sometimes you could just hit it ahead. It's that's already hey, a natural the, two on one. The ball, the ball mass moves faster than you do, right? So I mean, exactly. if, you can, if you can kick the pass ahead and get somebody else who's already down court, then you can create an opportunity for them to score one on one or score before the defense gets set. Absolutely, I think. With Alpi, first off, I fully agree, right? Alpi has that tendency where I think it's weird because it's like it's like a weird, like, okay, good, okay, then it's a bad habit, then it's like a good habit again where it's that middle part when he's, like, bringing the ball up in that, like, 50% range mm -hmm. of the court from, like, free throw line to free throw line. He just, he's staring down at the ground. He's, down. he's like, he's like Boban on the H-E-B commercial. <laughs> I'm bouncing it. I'm bouncing it. I'm bouncing it. Yeah. Like, that's what's happening. But the problem is when Alpi first gets the board, he does look for that outlet. Like sometimes he's like, okay, I'm looking around. Like you see him survey for a split second and then he'll hit the outlet pass occasionally. But then other times he'll survey and if nobody's open or if he doesn't see a man ahead of the play, he'll start putting it on the deck himself. And that's when you're like, uh, okay. Like, cause then he does the whole, like I'm staring down. Then he'll make it to like the opposing free throw line. And that's when he'll like, he'll go to pick the dribble up or he'll start that like his patented like full steam ahead, spin move, attack the basket, draw in the defense. And that's when he's like, okay, I'm like, I know where everybody is now. He had the one fast break where he drove it and he knew where Jay Sean Tate was on the entire break. Even though he was staring down at the floor, he knew he had Tate behind him the whole way. Drives it in, spins, jumps, relocates and finds Tate in like a split second and pitches it back to him and Tate goes up and finishes for two. It was not the prettiest of fast breaks, but it worked. Total so I, I fully agree. We need to get out. Like, even though the man has like eyes in the back of his head, we need to like tell him that he, he has to look somewhere other than the floor when he's doing the fast break transition thing. I, I don't know. It's, it's great observation, Madison. I, I could not agree more with you. Um, on that note, any final thoughts you have from this one? Anything else you want to chime in before we shut it down? Just another shout out to JC. Excellent minutes off the bench. He kept that lineup. He kept that lineup alive. Uh, excellent play from JC off the bench, man. I just want to give him a shout out on that. Absolutely. I mean, he was on fire. He had his 13 mm -hmm. points, six of seven shooting very much kind of feeling that like, in fact, his stat line in this game is very much like what I think he can give you on a consistent basis, right? Mm -hmm. 13 points, four boards, four assists, lightning rod off the bench, six of seven shooting. There's going to be some nights where maybe he doesn't have it offensively. And then there's going to be other nights where he might actually be able to get you a dub or at least win you those bench minutes because he is a walking bucket. Like when he's got it going, he can fill it up with the best of them. So with that, Madison, you know the drill. Let everybody know where to track you down at. Yeah, man. Come interact with me at, at Madman Leaks. Come talk draft with me. Rockets draft. Let's do it. That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you're listening to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Give me your thoughts from this Rockets win against the LA Lakers without LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Let me know in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets. Rockets basketball.